Welcome to this week's edition of Hacking TV. Speaking of hacking, whatever happened to BitTorrent? Streaming, it turns out, is coming to pirate video too. AT&T says it didn't buy DirecTV for the satellites, and it plans three over-the-top bundles. And we're back on YouTube and fair use. There's been a court case settled, and it has makers pretty freaked out. I'm I'm Saul Hansel. And I'm Steve Rosenbaum, and this is Hacking TV. So we're going to start out with a story that Steve didn't even want to include because he is so bored with big, boring old companies. Um, No, no, no. I'm bored with AT&T. Okay. So, so, you, so the, the, the story is AT&T, which, by the way, is the largest video provider in the world with 45 million subscribers to its video packages, um, mostly thanks to its acquisition of DirecTV, has announced they're going to introduce not one, but three different over-the-top bundles by the end of the year. Yeah, what? so, so, so let's, let's hold our breath and wait for that to happen. Okay, so I've been predicting this for a long time, um, and a bunch of stuff's going to happen. So, first of all, they they are essentially trying to compete with everybody. They've announced they've got three separate products. They have DirecTV Now, which is a cable service that you don't have to buy a set-top box for and have a guy come to your house. You just do it over the internet. They have a mobile version that's paid for, and they have a free ad-supported only version heavy on the millennials. The latter two in various combinations um, compete with um, Go90 from Verizon and answer to some degree what um, uh, T-Mobile has been doing with Netflix and some others. So, uh, so, so I think there's no way that happens. No way which happens. That these three things come out. So again, we're we're not privy to the inside of their deals, right? So right. we don't we don't know. But here's the thing I don't get, and why it makes absolutely no sense to me. It would be like me licensing the New York Knicks for a specialty broadcast in Cleveland, and then saying, "Oh yeah, but by the way, I'm going to put it on the internet," like. All of their deals for how they think, and again, they're they're smarter than I am, and they've got more lawyers than I do. But I've got to believe that their Direct TV deals were all for okay. Ready? Hold your breath for Direct TV. You think they were for a satellite? So you think I'm that they could just? I'm not so sure. So, so you th- this, you, th- you th- hold on hold on. Well, this makes they th- said that they have streaming rights. Second of all, their direct competitor in the satellite business, Dish already has Sling TV, which is an over-the-top, you know, cable-like bundle with ESPN and CNN. So I can't imagine why, even if they didn't put it into their contracts before, um, the um, that they couldn't go back and say, hey, if you're giving Charlie Ergen of Dish streaming rights, we get them too because we're a lot bigger and we pay you a lot more but, money. But, but, but you're comparing apples to oranges here. So... So first of all, everybody knows that the number of of direct of uh, of uh, boxes that what do you call it the the Charlie Isn't Arrigan, Sling. Right? Sling Sling TV has nothing to do with Sling. Right, right, right. So, yeah, but 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 it's a tiny little footprint. Six hundred thousand subscribers within the first year. And, uh, yeah, but they but they did those deals. They negotiated those right, deals. So all right, so you, well, there's something we don't. I mean, AT and T said in the press that they have the rights. Let's also think about. If I'm Viacom, Time Warner, uh, Disney, the suppliers to DirecTV, on one hand, anytime they want to do something, I'm going to get more money. But loosely speaking, I hate the idea that everyone's going to Netflix. So if somebody who resells my product, right, essentially DirecTV is a retailer for, you know, products manufactured by Disney and Time Warner. I want my retailers to move into the medium that people are using so uh, it's not obvious to me why even if the contracts don't say streaming rights why wouldn't disney and time warner give it to them because they get paid for every subscriber look i so stanky did an interview i went looking for it before the show and i wasn't able to find it in Uh which he said in this very sad sack kind of way video is really hard it's going to get harder we know we're late we're going to try and figure this out it was like really surprisingly befuddled 
And then they came out and made this announcement and said, we didn't really buy DirecTV because we love satellite distribution. Well, yeah, but that's what you bought. So if really what they bought was just the contracts, yeah, okay. I just so I am not predicting that AT and T is going to be a home run here. Um, well, that's good. So I, so I can't hold I, you to that I'm anyway. I'm predicting that it's important and it will have a bunch of other follow on effects, right? Just because of the footprint, forty five million customers, right? But it, so well, but not forty five million million television customers. No, 45 million television customers. It, for, which, for, which, for, which, for which service? For, for DirecTV around right. the world. Right. For, for the satellite service that they're, that they're now dissing. Right. But it, ultimately, you're buying channels. Nobody cares about the satellite. Right? Okay. But, but they care about the TV. I, I, so they, if, if DirecTV said, now it's even better... It comes right over your internet connection to about 90% of the people who live in a place where they can get broadband. Who cares? I mean, 10% of the people okay, live... So, so what percentage of the 45 million people... Here's the thing. You know, I live in New York City. I don't have satellite. I don't have satellite because I can't have satellite. If I put a satellite dish out my window, my building would come and make me take it down. My understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, and our, our, you know, our audience can, can email us or tweet us or send carrier pigeons our way and correct me. But I always thought part of why satellite did as well as it did was because it was in big chunks of the country that didn't have terrific broadband. Am I wrong? Um, I think that they also came in with lower prices, particularly Dish was a price competitor. And uh, DirecTV had some football exclusive rights and some other things. Um, and was a little bit cheaper. Um so, you know, those are decent sized businesses. Um, but here's what happens, right? Rich Greenfield wrote a piece that said, okay, the second that Com or that AT and T does that, Comcast will take Xfinity National. And I know that Comcast has the rights because my reporting from five years ago was that every contract that AT or that Comcast signed had a provision that said if anybody else runs a national over the top bundle we're going to run a na we have the right to take our bundle national as well okay that by the way so that's the headline in this segment of the show for sure and we have four segments today so we have a lot to cover but you know if if this ends up being Comcast going national you know over the top with their offering that's really interesting well of course it could why wouldn't they right so Brian Roberts, there was a Morgan Stanley Media Conference last week. So Brian Roberts said a couple of interesting things. One, he said that um, in the year ending now, first quarter, not, um, not calendar year, was the first 12-month period in 10 years where Comcast net increased its video subscribers, right? With satellite and telco and the internet all eating away at cable for a decade, they've turned it around. Two things have changed that. One, they're reacting to price competition with lower, you know, skinny bundles. And two, they're innovating the product by moving it into the cloud. So X1 is essentially a cheap little set-top box with a DVR in the cloud. You don't even need a cheap little set-top box. So Comcast is very quickly moving to a world where they really are an IP streaming provider even though they, you know, you, it looks like a cable company. And so there's absolutely no reason why they shouldn't sell that everywhere. And now let's walk through what happens. Time Warner Charter does the same thing. And Sony is our, you know, Sony has a, had a too expensive bundle. They just lowered the price and added ESPN. And everybody and their brother suddenly can go by the same damn cable networks. And we suddenly have more competition, which net net means lower prices. All right, so, good. so 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 let's leave the AT and T thing as you're bullish and I am bearish. I am bullish. So here's my prediction: I think that very soon the multi-channel market is going to get a second wind because it's going to be divorced from wires. You'll buy your wire, you'll buy your bundle, or you'll buy a skinny bundle. There will be a lot more innovation because it will be less oligopolistic. One other thing that goes with this, which we, we don't want to leave AT&T 
without just taking stock of the fact they also made an announcement that they were going to do something that sounds like gibberish, but it's really important. They were going to start offering programmatic TV commercial buying. What that basically means is that you'll be able to buy a commercial the way you buy an internet banner ad by targeting individuals um, and everybody will see a different commercial and um, people will be able to upload their customer lists. So people will show different TV commercials to people who are their customers, people who aren't their customers and demographics. That is going to radically change um, the TV advertising business, maybe for better, maybe well for worse. Um, but it's going to happen anyway. But. So so in my little focus group of one, I will tell you that my Romeo box, my TiVo Romeo box got upgraded three or four weeks ago. And now they've got some folks at TiVo sitting in a room making a little in and out point on every recording of every primetime television show. So when it gets to the commercial break, a little green box shows up on the screen and you press the channel up button. And not only do you have to, you don't, no longer do you have to scan through the commercials, it just hops to the show. Okay. You know, I can't tell you how much I love that. Advertising supported businesses are fundamentally not consumer friendly, except for the free part. Um, but all, all I'm saying is, you know, AT&T can be talking about targeting television, but there's, there's, you know, we'll talk in a little bit about BitTorrent. There's bigger consumer control issues afoot in terms of ad blocking and BitTorrent, and lots of other things that I think to me, you know, they're saying, hey, we have this really great new way to manufacture buggy whips. Good luck with that. You, you, so you're saying that all um, TV content, um, it, I'm sorry, that that, um, that all advertising supported video is uh, doomed like horse and buggies? Yeah. I mean, not tomorrow morning, but I think, look, the promise of the internet for as long as anyone can remember was we're going to make it smarter so that we're not going to have to interrupt your content, but instead we're going to deliver to you information and advertising and pricing and things that actually are targeted to you. And that promise has totally, totally failed. So, but, but who, you know, that's not, you know, that's not actually built into the technology. It's not like the internet is a product that was sold by somebody. People in Wired Magazine said that stuff, but in fact, businesses do what businesses do. But all, all I'm saying is, for as long as I can remember, the people in the advertising business would tell you, 50% of our advertising doesn't work, we just don't yep. know what 50%. So now when I can skip 100%, either through ad blockers or fast forward or whatever, you don't even have a 50-50 chance of reaching me, because I'm just like you, like the 50% of the time that you try and show me ads for you know, car tires or women's products or things I'm not going to buy because I don't own a car and I'm not a woman, you, you know, you, you, convi you, you ratify the problem with advertising, which is you're telling me if you allow me to, I will waste your time. I don't respect your attention. So now here, here, uh, no, that's true. Although that's let's true. go back to, <laughs> let, let, let's go back to, hold on, hold on. You just agreed with me. That's true. Good. Okay. Right. It's true that consumers don't like it, but let's also say, point out, what is Comcast doing? What is no doubt DirecTV going to do? Cloud-based DVR. A cloud-based DVR is, in a streaming world, right, is a good thing because you can rewind and forward fast, but they can make the commercials unskippable. It's not, it doesn't work like the TiVo. The, as much as the cable companies hate it, the idea in this FCC proceeding that they're going to get rid of the cable card in many ways is actually good for them, even though they think it's not, because the cable card is what would enable a, you know, you to use a TiVo-like device to record, um, you know, cable networks. And I, I just think you're defending the man on this episode. I'm, I think I'm not. I'm not saying that defending the man. I'm saying the man is going to be the man and has power because he has power, and just because I might not like it. I mean, I was watching, we should at some point talk about streaming the elections. I was watching uh, the returns on Super Tuesday um, on my cell phone um, and using the Fios app for CNN for a little bit. And 
they would weirdly either play the same three commercials over and over again or just have a blank screen that said people on TV are watching commercials and we don't we haven't sold any and it made you realize how big the commercial load is on cable and Look, it's like, the, thing I I, the thing I never get about those blank screens is why not just give the inventory away why would you it's not a, just say a, you know hey nice advertiser friend of ours you've been doing such a nice job buying ads on our commercial television cable network we're just going to give you spots on our digital like rather than remind the digital audience that there's no value in there in, in those spots I don't know uh, just me yes all right uh, but 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 let's but let's move on to security because security chapter two is sexy and fun and we disagree as much on this chapter as we did on the first chapter i i was really pleased to see uh you know bram cohen talking about apple and 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 security i thought that was uh a, a really interesting fun uh, uh moment in in web history that the inventor of BitTorrent was on Quora and basically saying, you know, Apple is is fighting the good fight because once we break open the Pandora's box, we're not going back. And you thought that was totally uninteresting. Lots of people have opinions. Um, I do think yeah, that but, the plan but, and the... But, yeah, but neither you nor I invented something that has changed the planet. So he gets a little bit more credit than we do. Okay. And Donald Trump put his name on a lot of buildings. Um... But I just I just want to say that when I tweet out that you compared Bram Cohen to Donald Trump, the hate you're, that will be voiced upon you, it will blow up your Twitter feed. Oh, no, I'm so <laughs> afraid. Um, uh, look, I, I think that BitTorrent is a is a genius. It, I, I'm not saying anything about that. I, I, BitTorrent is provocative and interesting. And so what's going on in that world, right? So. It's a competitive world in a weird way. So you you had um, uh, the um, it's not uh, the uh, what's it popcorn time, which was a streaming service, right? So downloads are out. So what teenager or other person who wants to find you know not pay for content would want to download something when you can stream it? Popcorn time got put out of business, but the Torrent World has figured out how to create a web page that can stream a torrent so you don't have to have downloadable software and you can go find the torrent on somebody's server, you know, in the Cayman Islands and watch the movie, which is a definite improvement in the customer experience. Might bounce back, you know, torrenting some, but loosely speak, you know, that's a real thing. But when you look at the music business, the big debate in music is no longer, oh my God, what about Napster and all the file sharing? It's what do we think about Tidal versus um, Spotify versus Apple Music? Everybody's all in a tizzy about who you should pay $10 a month to, not how you should get stuff free. I just think if you tie together the beginning of the show with the middle of the show, which yeah. is advertising doesn't work, but we don't care, and we're just going to keep interrupting your shows, and once we get the, the, the DVR out of your living room and up in the cloud, then we can force you as a behavior back into sitting through enormous spot breaks. You know, and then you look at the other side of the world, which is BitTorrent. You know, it seems to me that forcing consumers into bad experiences will have a bad, net net will have a bad outcome. Wait, wait what, what is forcing people into a bad experience? So, so the way you laid it out, we're gonna move the DVR experience into the cloud, we're gonna move it back to being owned by the cable companies, and then we'll be able to say, no, these, these ads are not skippable any longer, right? It's not so simple. I think that we are, that a cloud DVR has pluses and minuses. A big minus, big minus, no questions, unskippable commercials. If you ask me what I think about that, I think that in the future, the acceptable ad load that people will put up with is going to be a lot less than what they put up with on um, TV right now. Right. And, and let's just play that out. So the ad load goes down, but the CPMs remain what they are because you can't just force the market to double CPMs, which means the actual dollars coming into the media business fall off a cliff. 
There, I think that there that is a likely scenario. It's this is this is turning out to be quite a grim show we're recording. <laughs> I, also, um, remember what you know. We're talking about what's the if you want to watch something or listen to something that costs money to make, then it has to get paid for somehow. Part of what's going on here is that unlike ten years ago in the age of Napster, and unlike the Wire, Wired magazine information wants to be free. People are realizing that there's stuff that's worth paying for. So if DirecTV can come up and say for 20 or 30 or 40 or $50 a month, we have a whole bunch of channels you like. And guess what? You get to save the $10 a month because you're not buying a set-top box. And the cloud DVR may force you to watch some commercials. But on the other hand, you can then watch these shows on any device. Or guess what? You don't have to think about recording them. We're We're recording all of them for you so you can go watch everything on demand right the pluses of an on demand video world may be worth people paying something but i also think that just like in hulu hulu offers two prices with ads without ads which which do you subscribe to um whatever they defaulted me on to which is probably the more expensive one but um oh i i see i i, I bet wrong cuz i thought you were going to say neither cuz i subscribe to neither um, what, do you, I do, what do you get from Hulu that you don't feel you, like that you uh, need to pay peace for? Peace in the family because my kids want to watch something or another on it. But you don't even know what it is. I don't know what it is. Uh, it's probably some it, what? It's probably NBC. It's a series, you know. And, and if they knew how to use the FiOS app, they probably wouldn't even need that. But um, I'll, I'll come by and teach them. That'll be my, my that'll be my. But the FiOS thing. app. Remember the FiOS app. Which is a good is like more cable. I watch more cable on the FiOS app. I mean, I didn't have the set top box like plugged in until Super Tuesday. Um, I had a, it was unplugged. I just used the FiOS app, right? Once you have the FiOS app, why aren't we just having um, IP cable? Why shouldn't somebody well, who is in Pit- Pittsburgh and, and yet Ver- and yet Verizon is saying that they're dialing down their commitment to FiOS? No, well, there's a difference between FiOS, the thousand dollars a house, um, you know, broadband connection. Yeah, broadband connection, and the TV bundle. The TV bundle. There's no rational reason why they shouldn't sell the TV bundle at a minimum to everybody who has a Verizon wireless phone. All right, all right. So let's get to chapter three because chapter okay. three is. We spent an inordinate amount of time last week debating fair use. We really chewed on it for probably 20 minutes of the show. Yep. And, and a court hearing, a court case was ruled on um, with some, I think, fairly ground-shaking and surprising results. Um, um, in, in part because, at least for me, I didn't see it coming. And this is the Ray William Johnson uh, 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 case against Duke and, Duke and Media sued Ray William. Do, do you know, the story is that Juke and Media sued Ray William Johnson saying that he was using their clips and Ray William Johnson claimed fair use and said that he was that it was a tr- transformative use that he was and making them into. And did you watch any of them? How transformative were they? Well, I mean, define transformative. I mean, yeah. he, he, yeah. if you were, so this was is a case, it was a jury trial on the question of fair use which they settled before the jury um, released a verdict. Which, which, by the way, is fascinating, right? So literally the jury goes in the jury box and both sides of the case are now so panicked that they're going to lose that they sit in the room and they go, all right, look, let's split the difference. we got to settle this thing. Like, they, th- th- very rare to see those trials settled. You know, they, they often settle on the courthouse steps before the case begins. But to settle at the jury stage is very rare. The way the articles read to me was it looked like um, Ray William Johnson's side realized they were going to lose. And in fact, somebody said from the jury later said, we decided that zero out of 40 were fair use. Yeah. And and by the way, the announcement when they settled. So two things. It was supposed to be a sealed verdict. The 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 when it when it came out. There was a Ray William Johnson had done a deal with Juke and Media to continue to use their stuff. Okay. So clearly they did two things. They paid a little bit of money, but they also figured out that that having him promote and market and generate traffic for their clips 
was better than having him not have access to it. Well, at, at a price. But so this obviously doesn't set any precedence because it's a sealed out of court settlement. But what it does is it's a shot across the bow of YouTube creators, because if if you read this case as saying they were afraid that the jury was not going to support them in fair use, this will embolden um, more law, you know, lawsuits by well, it's not lawsuits because what happened was right the the um, under the DMCA, Dukin, you know, used this sort of extra legal ability just to have the stuff taken down. And so Johnson had to sue saying that wasn't appropriate. And that kind of suit, rare as it is, is going to be even more rare because it looks like it's a harder thing to prove than uh, my thought. All my fair use friends are are, uh, deeply upset by the outcome. Surprised and upset. The, um, it's, do you see where, is this in L.A.? I mean, what jury... Uh, oh, that's an interesting question. I mean, I L.A. It... is filled with people who get money, get paid by making copyrighted things. So if it was, if the suit was there, that may not be the right venue to make that particular um, case. But, um, you know, it's an... It will be interesting to see how that plays out. I, I you know. but, by the way, just just for fun, I have to read you some of the forty-eight Jukin videos that were included. Were groom drops bride, dog thinks Terrence ter- ter- door, door is closed, funniest slingshot video of all times. Uh, I mean, these were clearly groundbreaking, important pieces of content that were being. Uh, just, <laughs> really, I mean, we have to go to court over groom drops bride. I well, love that. By I, way, don't I, I love that. You could make the argument that this was a newsworthy video that could come under the uh, exemptions about news and discussion, but we will see. Right, it's, so, there's going to be more of this. So, Meerkat, yeah, Meerkat, a year ago, took over South by Southwest. Everybody thought it was the next big thing. Live streaming app, and guess what? Like certain people around here say, live streaming is lame and nobody wants to do it. Um, and you, you they know, have to come out. They are pivoting to some completely different business model because there isn't a, a market so, for. So you're you're confusing. You're right about the facts, but you're totally wrong about the either why it happened or what it means. You're just okay. Confused. So first of all, Meerkat was launched, and Twitter woke up from its slumber and said, "Hey, wait a minute." Why are we letting them have all this live streaming goodness when we can just do Periscope? And essentially they cut Meerkat off from their Twitter followers and spun up Periscope. And for a period of time, people were loyal and tried to use both and tried to. But but the truth is, you know, people are kind of lazy and they went, yeah, all right, Periscope. And so Meerkat got boxed out of its distribution platform, which was which was Twitter. That no, there's no shortage of growth in the live streaming business None whatsoever. It's growing massively. Okay. And, you know, and the number of feeds that now show up, I don't, maybe you don't follow them, but the number of feeds that show up on my Facebook news feed that say going live, going live, going live, I mean, literally increases every single day. Every I, single day. I have exactly one, and it's you. And um, I, you were at some conference on Super Tuesday, and I tuned in. And I couldn't figure out where you were or why you were going live. The, the the app needs a little bit of work. I'd like to be able to be a little clear about where I am and who's on the stage, but that'll come. And follow Gary Vaynerchuk. He's on all the time. Follow Robert Scoble. He's on all the time. They're doing, both of them are doing terrific, terrific, smart, well-produced shows. Boy, I am a believer in editing and on demand. I never want to watch something live if I can watch it so I can forward fast it and skip it. Live means I have no control, and we live in a world where people want more and more control. I, I, I will only say this. We will, we will return to this conversation six months from today, and the data that I will show you will make you either believe that you're just out of touch with how the web is changing. Because, by the way, I was totally with you. I had this whole speech about being able to program my life and have instead of it program me and blah, 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 and all that stuff. And by the way, after you go live on Facebook, it still archives it. You can still watch it later. 
But I really like the conversation when Gary starts talking. I like hearing people talking to him. I like the interaction. I like the sense that it's that there's that that his responses are, you know, to use a word that I'm awfully fond of, unfiltered, if you will. So it is true. So there are a couple of reasons why this is a good idea. One, it makes the production easier, right? We figured out on this podcast that we want to do it in one take, whether we're doing it live or not. We want to pretend like it's live because editing while good for listeners is bad for producers. That's so, your take, not mine. I don't, I, I don't edit because I like the feeling of having a conversation as opposed to producing a show. Okay. And, and, and by the way, I think you're fascinating in this week in particular. Well, thank you so much. And um, in the other, uh, but in any case, the live format lets you do that and then have it on demand in a nice, easy way. And easy always wins. Um, also, if there's a conversation, if you build your talk radio and, you know, Gary has a big enough following that, yeah, there are going to be people who want to be part of the studio audience. And maybe that's only 1%, but maybe that's okay, right? I mean, every piece of data I've ever seen, when you talk to someone who does live streaming, you say, what is the percentage, you know, how many people are watching you live? And it's like less than 5%. Changing every day. We are out of time, my friend. Okay. I am off to get on an airplane in a couple of days to go to Austin. It'll be me and the President of the United States and his wife. A little private little gathering with 80,000 of my closest friends for South by Southwest. And I will bring you uh, video and conversations and content from, from that extraordinary conference. Well, you know, hope you get a chance to listen to a little music um, and enjoy Austin as well as you know, nerds like the President of the United States. Um, we'll see you next week. Okay. Keep on hacking, everybody.